Jamie Shea a devenit o figură publică foarte cunoscută în timpul războiului din Iugoslavia, în calitate de purtător de cuvânt al NATO, poziție pe care a ocupat-o în perioada 1993-2000. În perioada de aderare a României a susținut cu multă căldură înființarea unui centru NATO în cadrul Școlii Naționale de Studii Politice și Administrative. Aici au fost pregătiți viitorii funcționari NATO români. După aproape 10 ani de activitate a României în Organizația Nord-Atlantică, Jamie Shea a primit titlul de Dr. Honoris Causa al SNSPA. Jamie Shea este profesor la Colegiul Europei din Bruj și profesor asociat la Universitatea Americană de Relații Internaționale din Washington, D.C. Mr. Shi, before the interview, I learned that you have a very important contribution to Romanians' preparation for joining NATO. Did you have a special, a personal reason for that? Well, first of all, I think it's probably exaggerating uh, to say that I had an important contribution, but I was certainly an advocate of Romania's uh, uh, membership of NATO well before the summit, the Prague summit in 2002, when Romania was invited. Uh, why? Well, I always believed that Romania would make a big contribution to NATO. It's a serious country, it's serious about defense, it's serious about contributing to NATO's missions. I mean, today you have 1,800 troops in Afghanistan, which is, I think, the fifth or the sixth biggest contribution. So I knew that you know, Romania would be a country which would be a, a central member of the, of, of the alliance. The second thing, as you know, back in the 1990s, there was a great deal of Romanian public enthusiasm uh, for NATO. And, and my sense is if you had a country where people wanted to join NATO, and secondly, a country which was prepared to make a big contribution, it should be among the first new members and not among the last new members. It, it was frustrating, admittedly, when uh, you remember in the first round yes. there were only three Uh, but I was you know, very glad in 2002 when we finally uh, did justice to Romania uh, and uh, you, you, you joined and it's been a, a happy story for us and hopefully for you ever, ever since. How did Romania look like before joining NATO and how does it look today after almost 10 years? I think that the, the key thing is that Romania is a country which has a large military force, uh, which also has a very good state security structure intelligence services, uh, for example, uh, and therefore Romania is a country which is able to participate in all of the missions of NATO, not just a few, whether they be uh, traditional missions like Article 5, collective defense, or new missions like sending forces to Afghanistan, or what I've been talking uh, about here during my visit to Bucharest yesterday, yesterday and today, which is the issue of cyber defense, cyber security, which obviously is a, a challenge that none of us were aware of 10 or 15 years ago, but where Romania has done a lot, signing a memorandum of understanding with NATO on cyber defense, uh, establishing a national cyber security strategy, having a very good joined up approach of the, of the, of the government, uh, uh, and very good intelligence on cyber uh, threats, which uh, Romania shares with the other uh, allies. So my sense is, is that it's been a good story because this is a country which is able to position itself in many NATO issues, whether it be the Balkans, where Romania has played a big, big, big role, uh, particularly in terms of bringing Serbia closer to the Euro-Atlantic institution, stabilizing the Balkans, the Black Sea cooperation with countries like Ukraine and Turkey, Or, as I say, uh, missions like Afghanistan. So you really are a, 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 this is not flattering you, you're a central player in NATO today. How was it when you were spokesman for NATO in, during the war in Yugoslavia? <laughs> well, what can I say? I mean, we had our good times and our bad times, uh, 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 frankly. Um, It, it was not an easy job uh, because, as you know, I saw it once. You, you really remember, was, you remember. Yes. I mean, people expected the Kosovo campaign to be very short, and it lasted for 80 uh, days. Um, and, and the public, as you know, it gets very impatient these days when conflicts drag on for a, 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 a long period. Um, we didn't have a, a UN Security Council resolution, so there was a debate about whether this was a, you remember, a legal uh, a conflict. Um, of course, uh, we had to deal with unexpected problems like the expulsion of the Kosovo Albanian population, the refugees and, and, and the rest. Uh, so it, it was not always an easy uh, job. And uh, in any conflict, uh, and you know this, things go wrong. Uh, you remember the... Or things now are going not like in plan. Exactly. You know, that's right. Uh, uh, Napoleon said, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. You remember the Chinese embassy, uh, yes. the, the TV building, the, 
the, the bridge, the, tra the tractor convoy, we had these uh, uh, mistakes with the airstrikes and it was not always easy to stand up and have to explain to the media and the public why we hit the wrong target, why sometimes uh, innocent civilians were killed. Let's speak about media. At that time, two words made the headlines. Collateral damage. <laughs> yes. Weren't they quite cynical? The, uh, cynical, no. no. I mean, cynical is a deliberate yeah. sort of yeah. intention to be uh, light or flippant uh, about civilian deaths. It was never that. Unfortunately, however, in any organization, a certain amount of jargon is used, which is okay, if you like, on the inside among military people, but is not very uh, useful or helpful when that jargon is used on the outside of the public. And I said publicly at the time that using the terminology collateral damage, which people on the inside understood, but using it on the outside was a bad mistake. Communication is about choosing the right words, showing sensitivity, uh, and I'm obviously very pleased that uh, NATO spokespeople don't use that term uh, uh, today. So, uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes, particularly when you're in a stressful environment. But the key thing is learn from your mistakes and don't repeat them afterwards. Today you are the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security uh, Challenges. Yeah. What responsibilities do you have? Well, uh, essentially uh, five things. So it's quite quite a mixed bag. Uh, the first thing I mentioned it already is cyber defense, because as you know, cyber crime, cyber threats, um, the vulnerability of the internet to criminal activity. This is unfortunately an increasing uh, reality of, of, of life for you, for me, for governments, for military establishments, for banks virtually for everybody now. So we need to have more cyber protection. So that's one. The second issue is energy security, and Romania is very interested, of course, in this issue. The, the third issue is terrorism. Bin Laden is dead, but Al-Qaeda is still alive, so the terrorist threat is still there. We have to be better at anticipating it, guarding against it, so that's number one. Then we have uh, proliferation issues which is linked, of course, to the missile defense system. And finally, uh, what we call strategic analysis. So, as you know, today uh, we uh, have very little money for defense. The military budgets are going down. Uh, dealing with a crisis like Afghanistan costs a lot of money. It's very expensive. We know that. The United States uh, is spending uh, virtually $3 billion a week in Afghanistan. It's difficult to sustain that. So the idea here is that we have to be better at anticipation. We have to predict the crisis. We have to prevent the crisis. And so what w I'm trying to do in, in my new job with my colleagues, of course, is help NATO to identify tomorrow's crisis and to see today what we can do to prevent that crisis uh, 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 ending up in an expensive war, which we would then have to try to respond to. It's not easy, but the financial crisis, as well as common sense, forces you in that direction. What are the role of the Eurotantic Center of the National School of Political Studies and Public Administration in the training of NATO Romanian officials? Well, I, I think the record speaks for itself. I mean, I, I, every time... You are I, the father of that center. I, I've been involved in it, yes. I think that uh, uh, Professor Sekaris, uh, you know, takes much of the credit, but I've been involved since the beginning, and uh, it's been a great success story. I, I think that uh, if you go around uh, and you speak to uh, ministers, you speak to Romanian ambassadors, Romanian business people, you'll find that a large number of them have either been students here or have, have, have had some connection with, with the school. A and uh, in today's world, uh, where uh, uh, you must understand economics, uh, you, because economics is affecting increasingly our lives and security, you have to have a grasp of security issues, you have to have an international outlook, you have to speak different languages. Uh, this is a school which has, as I said, proven its value in, in training the type of people you, that you need for leadership roles today. The other thing is that when I spoke to some of the students earlier today, I noticed that the great majority seem to be women, and I think this is fantastic if this is the case, that this is a school which is uh, 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 taking advantage of the talent of Romanian women and not just the talent of Romanian men. How do you see the future of this center in the development of positive relations between NATO and the Black Sea countries? I think we're in a world today where 
uh, we need to understand issues better before we have to deal with them. We need to anticipate crises. Um, the, the type of talents that this school fosters, I think, is helping to form people who uh, will not sleepwalk, if you like, into the next crisis, but will be better able to understand the world and where it's going and, and to influence events. The Black Sea is important because th this is now uh, uh, an area where uh, we have the potential of energy discoveries, uh, natural gas, uh, uh, oil in the future. It's a major transit route, uh, of course, for, for European pipelines. international yeah. trade. We, we yeah. have pipelines. But it's also a sea that brings together NATO members, Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, of course, uh, non-NATO members, U Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, countries that want to join NATO, like, like Georgia, but which, let's be honest, sometimes have internal or, or at least disputes among them themselves. Uh, if the Black Sea, uh, using economics, using energy, uh, regional cooperation, can bring people together, in other words, the sea not dividing people, but the sea uniting people, this type of regional cooperation often lays the basis for NATO or the European Union to be successful at the strategic level. So I personally am very glad that this is an issue which Romania continues to promote in the alliance, because I think that we, in Europe of today, we, we need more regional uh, uh, cooperation. And sometimes you can cooperate in economics or in transport or in energy in a way that maybe you can't in missile defence or uh, military operations or, or terrorism or whatever. So. Uh, we need to develop the regional cooperation where it's possible, and I think the Black Sea has a lot of potential. After the NATO meeting in Bucharest, nobody talked about the admission of other countries. Would Romania remain the eastern border of the alliance? Well, uh, for now, yes. Uh, but never say never. You remember that James yes. Bond movie? I think it's a wise advice because uh, when I was at NATO uh, in, in the 1980s, if you would have told me that Romania will be a member of NATO before the end, of, you know, just shortly after the end of the 20th century, I've said, go see a psychiatrist, you're, you're, you're mad. Um, uh, if, if we'd have had a, a, a Russian ambassador attending NATO meetings on a regular basis, so you're completely crazy. NATO will do an operation in Libya and Afghanistan. Again, I would have said, uh, you're crazy. Uh, and yet these things have happened. So I, I think that you know, if you look at what has happened over the last 20 years, you have to keep an open mind. We certainly have countries that want to join NATO. I mentioned Georgia yeah. already. And we have made a promise of eventual membership, as you know, here in Bucharest in yes, 2008. Yeah. To you mentioned this, to Ukraine and, 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 and Georgia. We have obviously countries too in the Balkans, uh, though you mentioned the eastern border. Uh, we already have former uh, members of the Soviet Union, although reluctant members of the Soviet Union, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that have been uh, members of the alliance since uh, Romania. So for the time being, the circumstances are not right. Let, let's be key, uh, uh, frank about that. Ukraine, since the change of government, uh, is not currently seeking uh, NATO uh, membership. Only Georgia uh, is actively. Um, but I, I think it's not good for European security if we say the door is closing. You're in, you're out. You know, there is a new dividing line that you can't cross. Uh, I, I think countries would lose their incentive also to reform and come closer to the Euro-Atlantic structures. So for the time being, we're not certain right, not right, but that doesn't mean to say that we should uh, close the door. What are the relations between NATO and European Union in terms of security policies? Is NATO today more American and less European? Well, oh, th th those are good questions. Uh, let me answer the second first, if I may. Uh, it's, it's obviously true that the United States still uh, produces a lot of the defence capabilities of the alliance. Uh, and a lot of provides a lot of the political leadership, but I think we have to be honest about that. Um, that's not a bad situation because you know NATO expresses the Canadian American commitment to the security of Europe. It's a transatlantic alliance, um, and so it's good that the Americans still want to be engaged in Europe, you know, like with the missile defence system. Uh, and it's good that in si situations like Libya, you can count on the Americans to provide you know, the in-flight refueling aircraft, to provide the drones, uh, to provide the intelligence, the reconnaissance, um, the cruise missiles that destroyed uh, Gaddafi's air defense at the beginning. And uh, let's be honest, without that American contribution, I'm not sure uh, if the Europeans by themselves uh, could have run the operation or terminated it when it terminated. So the US contribution is still absolutely vital. But you're right, the US now faces big 
challenges at home. Uh, 27 million Americans are either out of a job or are underemployed. The, the U.S. has not known that since the Great Depression. Almost 10% of the population. Yeah, absolutely. That, not since the Great Depression. Um, you've seen the Occupy Wall Street. I mean, okay, these are small things, but you know, the, the, there is a sense in the United States, and President Obama has reflected this, that nation building should be at home and not just in Afghanistan or somewhere else. The, the second thing, of course, is, is the defense budget is going down. We know that $450 billion dollars is going to be taken away from the defense budget over the next few years. And so the United States is saying to Europe, look, you know, you cannot rely on us like you did in the past. I mean, today, today, the United States spends 75% of the NATO defense budgets. That's enormous. It was only 50% 10 years ago. So clearly the Americans expect the Europeans to do more. And if you look at the European defense budgets, which are going down, but which are still 200 billion euros, 31% of global defense spending minus the United States, Europe should be able to do more. And so we have to find a way for Europe to use its defense resources better to produce a more equal relationship. But that's, that's clear, that's urgent now after Libya. Um, NATO EU, we have a good relationship. We cooperate in the Balkans, in Kosovo, we cooperate in Bosnia, we cooperate in Afghanistan, but it should be a better relationship than it is. We should have more coordination, we should have less duplication of, of, of effort, um, but uh, gradually uh, we are uh, uh, I improving. But the, the two organizations have, I think, 21 common members today, uh, and, and so we really do need uh, to have, a, as I say, a, a, a closer relationship uh, than, than we have. And now Romania is part of the Ballistic Missile Defense Program. Why does Europe need this shield? What are the challenges this new project generates in relations with Russia? I think that if you look at the periphery of Europe, you have 30 countries uh, that are producing ballistic missiles. Uh, most of those countries can technically, technically strike Europe uh, given the range of those missiles. The Iranians are improving the quality and the, the range yeah. of their missiles all the time. So uh, Europe now uh, is within striking distance uh, of uh, ballistic missiles that could tomorrow have nuclear, chemical, biological uh, warheads. Uh, if a ballistic missile landed on, on a city of Europe, uh, imagine the shock waves, I I imagine the impact. I mean, think of what happened after 9-11 with a, some terrorists using two conventional aircraft and the way the world changed. So this is something that we have to take seriously. Uh, 20 years ago, there was no solution. Missile defense was an idea, not a reality. Today, technology gives you the solution to be able to intercept and shoot down those missiles so that you cannot be attacked. And again, if a country like Iran sees that the Europeans have a missile shield, Iran loses a lot of its incentive uh, to try to develop missiles or uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so the missile shield has a deterrence value uh, as well as being a form of protection. Uh, and, and essentially the Americans are providing a, a lot of the system. So this is affordable despite the difficult budgetary environment, affordable for the Europeans, uh, and therefore it's a NATO priority at the moment. Uh, obviously we are delighted that Romania is cooperating with the agreement which was uh, approved by Parliament, I think this is excellent news, uh, to help with the, uh, the radar. Other countries, Turkey, Poland, uh, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, are also uh, contributing uh, as, as, as well. But I, th I see this as a good insurance policy in the future. Russia. It's true, the Russians have a different concept than we have. Uh, and uh, we need to work with the Russians more. Uh, first of all, to persuade them that the NATO missile shield is not directed against them. That's not at all. It, it has no capacity to destroy Russia's large number of strategic uh, nuclear rockets. So the Russian nuclear deterrence will not be undermined by this, so we have to convince Russia of that. Uh, and secondly, we have to convince Russia uh, to cooperate with us in finding a way to make the Russian missile system, because they have one too, they have a missile system too, defense system, to make their system interoperable and to interact with ours. I think we'll find a solution, but it's going to take some time.
What are the security issues arising from the recent political changes around the world? I think that it's basically relatively good news. I mean, there is a tendency when we look at Afghanistan, when we look at Iraq, uh, to think, oh my God, the world is becoming more violent. Uh, there are more wars, you know, the world is becoming more disorderly. The, the, the good news is that's not true. The last major war between two great powers was 60 years ago in Korea. The last territorial war between two nations, Ethiopia, Eritrea, finished 10 years ago. All of the scientific evidence is that every decade, fewer and fewer people die uh, from wars, from armed conflict. Last year, 55,000, the lowest figure I in centuries. Uh, civil wars are finishing faster than they begin. Peacekeeping uh, works. D can, let me give you a statistic. 55,000 people died in armed conflict. Fi 530,000 died from domestic violence, organized crime, drugs, criminality. So what we're seeing, I in fact, is that civilization is, is becoming more peaceful. Peacekeeping is, is working, is being more effective. So it's not always doom and gloom. Secondly, there's a lot of speculation about China, you know, the India, right. the rising powers leading the conflict. I, I, I don't believe this. China has not fired a shot for 25 years. Uh, many of the rising powers, India, uh, Brazil, South Africa... Are economic powers. Uh, and democra democracies. See. Democracies. This is not like the 30s when the rising powers were Hitlerian, Stalinist, totalitarian. So I, I'm not complacent. You can never be complacent in security. But, you know, the trends are not all bad. But I, I think, however, there are three massive challenges. Uh, the first challenge is we have seven billion people on the planet. It took us from zero to 1850 to produce the first billion people. The last one billion, from six billion to seven billion, it took 10 years to produce. So I, we have to look at this issue of the planet with 10 billion people living on it. Second issue, the impact of climate change, which I believe will affect security, migration, de desertification, water shortages over the next few years. And the third issue, which I think we need to think about, is, is, is Europe. Where is Europe in all of this? You know, m much of our hope for a peaceful world is based on the European model, you know, democracy, prosperity, social security, but the market economy, integration, soft power, norms. If we in Europe lose Europe, there won't be very much Europe I in the rest of the world. So we have to preserve uh, th this Europe, not just for us, but for the example that it can give for the rest she of the world. understand uh, we will not see the end of the history, as Fukuyama said. No, uh, we, we, we unfortunately, well, it all depends. And <laughs> if you're a policy maker, you want to see the end of history. If you're an academic or a journalist, you don't want to see the end of history. How does the economic crisis affect the security environment? Do you believe that the economic crisis could turn into the Third World War? The answer is no, uh, I, I don't believe it will, because we, we have certain things that we uh, didn't have uh, back in the 1930s. First of all, we have economies which, unlike Hitler's Germany, unlike Stalin's Russia, uh, even unlike the United States in the 1930s, economies which are not autarkic, which are totally bound up with the rest of the world. The Chinese know very well that if Europe becomes bankrupt, the first country to suffer economically will be China. Uh, same with the United States. The major exports. So there's much more sense of, of, of international solidarity, not because of charity, but because interdependence means that things are uh, very much in people's uh, interest. That's not to say we won't have some difficult times in Europe. But, but I don't think this is the, the kind of, you know, uh, isolationism, aggressive isolationism that we saw in the 1930s. Second thing, we've got international organisations now. 1930s, you know, we just had the League of Nations, which didn't work. Now we have NATO, the EU, the UN, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we've got these strong institutions which enable, enable us to negotiate, to find solutions, to make compromises, uh, and, and so on. Uh, that's next. Uh, thirdly, the reason I gave, uh, great powers are much less interested in conflicts now, war. 
uh, than they were. I mean, if you look at the United States even, the wars that America has been in, uh, like in Afghanistan or, or Iraq or, or Libya, were not imposed on the United States. You know, it, this is not the 1930s where Hitler imposed war on the Western democracies. We had no choice. These are wars which we have chosen, uh, rightly in my view, but we've chosen to be involved in. So I think uh, that the, the, the fact that the great powers today uh, are more aware of the limitations of conflict it is also a positive factor. That said, uh, it's in our interest to solve the economic crisis as quickly as possible. We shouldn't test fate. Mr. Shi, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.